Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, virtual workshop. It's my pleasure to uh, talk about the measurement principle of life and the technology requirement. Um, over the next uh, 20 minutes, I will uh, give a brief status about uh, the huge progress that have been made in interferometry over the past uh, decades. Um, and I will explain where we stand uh, and what we need to do in order to make life uh, happen in the following decades. I would like to thank uh, my colleagues uh, listed here on this slide for helping me and, and sending me uh, slides uh, for, this, for this presentation. Um, so where do we stand today in, in, in exoplanet imaging? So this is a, a typical picture that we can take uh, with a state-of-the-art eight meter class telescope. Uh, you can see four giant exoplanets uh, on, on this picture. The star is masked at the center by a coronagraph. And so typically we are sensitive to planets which are five to 10 AU from uh, uh, the central star. We can, take, uh, we can characterize these exoplanets uh, by taking spectra. Um, so this is an example here. You can see a K-band spectra of HI799E. That's the inner planet around, around that star. And uh, actually last year, we obtained the first, uh, uh, the gravity collaboration uh, obtained the first uh, interferometric measurement of an exoplanet. And that's a remarkable result uh, that you can see by the, the gray point on, on this uh, spectrum. Uh, that's, that's the gray point. That's a remarkable result because the, the precision on this spectrum is really, really good. It's five to 10 times better than what we can get with, with single ditch uh, eight meter class telescope. The precision also on, on the astrometry on this kind of measurement is, is, is really good. And so the challenge right now in, in exoplanet imaging is to go closer to the star. Um, so we want to go in the habitable zone. So this is the red circle that you see um, on, on, the, on, on the background plot here. Uh, and we, we, we want to design an instrument that can go inside this habitable zone and make the same kind of measurement. And we know now from Kepler that there are a lot of these uh, rocky exoplanets in this zone. We just don't know how to directly image them. Uh, we, we cannot do that right now. So what are the, the technical uh, requirements uh, to achieve this, uh, the detection of these exoplanets in the habitable zone at 10 micron? Um, there are basically three main requirements. That's angular resolution. We need high angular resolution, uh, contrast, and sensitivity. And on this plot, uh, you can see the contrast at 10 micron as a function of angular separation for a uh, a random but realistic uh, exoplanet population. So this is an exoplanet population that was generated based on the Kepler statistic um, by the, the, the software that Sasha mentioned just before. Um, the color of the, of the points uh, depends on the, the spectral type of the star. Uh, you can see the purple vertical line. That's the inner working angle of current uh, eight meter class telescope. So basically at, at 10 micron right now, we can resolve the habitable zone around uh, the closest star to us, which is Alpha Centauri, uh, A and B. Uh, with the next generation extremely large telescope, uh, like the ELT and the Metis instrument uh, at 10 micron, uh, the inner working angle would be the, this vertical blue line. So it would be possible to uh, image a few more um, habitable zones around us. Um, but in order to really characterize a significant number of uh, rocky exoplanets, we need a much better angular resolution, a larger telescope. And so if you take a nulling instrument, an interferometric instrument uh, with a 500 meter baseline uh, at 10 micron, the, this, this green line shows you what kind of angular resolution we can get. And this is sufficient to characterize most habitable zones around nearby stars. The second constraint is to uh, achieve a really huge contrast, a good contrast between the star and the planet. Um, so this is the horizontal uh, blue, green box here. Um, and the position of this horizontal line depends on the instrument stability. The, the, the more stable your instrument, the lower can be this line. And uh, this will be driven by the science requirement that we are currently uh, working on with the live science team. Uh, but to give you an idea, uh, we need to achieve contrasts which are typically 10 to the minus 6. So we, we need to suppress the starlight uh, by a factor of, of 
one million more or less in order to characterize all these uh, exoplanets. So what, what is a good solution to do that? There, there is a solution which is called nulling interferometry, which combine actually uh, starlight rejection and angular resolution. Uh, it was proposed the first time in 1978 uh, in the Nature paper uh, by Bracewell. And the idea is shown by this graph on the, right, on the right. And the idea is to combine the light from two different telescopes in phase opposition. So you introduce a pi phase shift in one of the arms. And when you do that, you produce a destructive interference on the line of sight. So that's the bottom right plot. Um, you can see that the star, which is on the line of sight, um, will be uh, uh, cancelled by the destructive interference. And a planet which is off axis can be transmitted. Um, and so the position of the maximum of transmission depends on the, the baseline and the wavelengths at which you, you observe. There is a good way to, to see this. Uh, that's the middle um, map here. This is a transmission map of a 2, 2D, uh, a two element uh, nuller. So you can see white uh, fringes and, and dark fringes. And the transmission map of a nuller is some kind of photon sieve that you put on the sky. Everything that falls on the dark stripe, a dark fringe, will not be transmitted. And everything that falls on a, on a white fringe will be transmitted. On top of that, you can, uh, this is what, what was proposed by Bracewell in the first paper, is to rotate the instrument. And when you do that, you can see that the planet, which is this little uh, blue uh, dot, will uh, be modulated with the rotation angle. So you will go, you, you can see the transmission uh, as a function of rotation angle at, in the bottom middle plot. So it will go between one and, and zero. And it's important to modulate the planet signal in order to retrieve it uh, against uh, noises. This is really the key. If you observe the same system, uh, so it's in this case, that's a um, nurse sun system at 10 parsecs with a 10 meter class telescope. This is what you would get on the left plot. So you can see the PSF of the central star and the position of the planet. And so the planet will be hidden by the, the, the PSF of the central star. So it will be within the diffraction limit of this 10, 10 meter class telescope. For life, we are considering uh, more than two telescopes. So this is what you can see on the right plot. You can see uh, the transmission map of a, of a four element uh, instrument. And so you can see now that this uh, transmission map is, is going in 2D. Um, and the idea to do that is to increase the modulation efficiency, the modulation speed of the planet, because the highest the modulation frequency, the better you can uh, subtract uh, noises. Um, and so you can see the, the, the transmission as a function of rotation angle at, in the bottom plot, and you can see that the frequency is, is higher in this case. Um, so the, the, the technique which is used uh, for a four element nulling instrument is, co is called phase shopping. And the way it works is summarized on this, on this uh, scheme here. So on the left, you see uh, the four elements of, of the, the array, uh, two at the top and two at the bottom. And so the, each pair is a nulling instrument. And the destructive output of each of these nulling instruments is combined together um, on, a, on a plate and produce these two uh, chop states, that's the, the, the two middle uh, plots, which are anti-symmetric. And then when you do the difference between the two chop states here, you produce the modulation map, which is the top right plot here, which is the response of the instrument uh, to the sky. If you add the rotation to this, uh, you can modulate your planet signal really quickly. And then you can produce the point, point, point spread function that you see at the bottom right plot, which is similar to what uh, Sasha was showing before, where you can see the, the planet on the left part of this plot and then an anti-symmetric response on the right part. Um, and so the idea is to use templates uh, to uh, demodulate the planet signal in order to find uh, where is your planet in the field and, and to retrieve multiple planets as, as shown by, by Sasha. So why do we need to go to space? Uh, the main reason is, is obviously the sensitivity. So if you, if you look at, uh, at stars from the ground um, at 10 micron, uh, it's really difficult. So the, 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 
the atmosphere is as bright as the brightest star in the sky. And so it's something like 100 times, 100 million times brighter than exoplanets, than a, a rocky exoplanet. So it's not possible to observe a large number of, of, of planets from the ground. We need to go to space to, to achieve the right sensitivity. Um, and a formation flying space interferometric instrument will combine uh, all, all the elements that we need for this kind of science. So the sensitivity from uh, the space environment the stability and precision also, uh, and the angular resolution provided by the interferometric baseline. So it really combined all the three uh, requirements uh, for these uh, challenging uh, tasks. Now I will jump into the uh, technological requirements um, for this kind of mission. Um, the first one is uh, formation flying. So this is to achieve the angular resolution. If we need a baseline of 500 meters, uh, currently there is no way to launch a, a telescope which is that big, a monolithic telescope which is that big in space. Uh, we need formation flying technologies, um, starlight suppression, so that's snelling interferometry, but there are technologies involved behind this to uh, achieve a really stable uh, starlight suppression. And then a really good sensitivity uh, that can be provided by uh, passive cooling of a low thermal noise and a really good, excellent uh, mid-IR uh, detectors. So now I will revise um, quickly each of these three points uh, and uh, give a few, and say a few words about ongoing activities uh, on these three topics. So formation flying, uh, the requirements it's, are not that stringent, unlike what uh, most people believe. Uh, so we only need a, a positioning accuracy of a few centimeter uh, between the telescope. Um, the rest of the correction will be taken care by uh, internal loops and, 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 and piezo mirrors uh, inside the, the beam combiner spacecraft. Uh, we need at least four spacecraft in order to do phase chopping, uh, and the array has to rotate uh, to, to have this modulation of the planet signal and, and, and being able to, to, to recover the position of the planet. So where do we stand in, in formation flying today? So there was a mission called uh, PRISMA. It's a Swedish mission that was launched in uh, 2010, um, which demonstrated formation flying with two, uh, two small spacecraft uh, called Mango and Tango that you can see on the bottom uh, plot. And they demonstrated the formation flying with a precision of a few centimeter RMS over four hours. Uh, in 2022, there will be a NISA mission called, called Proba3 uh, to demonstrate uh, an even better precision uh, of a 100 micron RMS, uh, be positioning accuracy between the two uh, spacecraft. Uh, and this will exceed the, the control requirement on, on life. Uh, past decades, there have also been some work in the lab at JPL, a lot of work actually about formation control test beds. Uh, they, they use three spacecraft in 2D on, on air cushions to demonstrate the rotation and then positioning uh, algorithm of uh, a lifelike uh, array. Um, and they demonstrated the precision of five centimeter RMS in, in, in this case. Ongoing activities on formation flying. So there was a news last week that NASA selected a, a mission called Sunrise uh, from the University of Michigan. Uh, and it's a six unit CubeSat flying at 10 kilometers from each other and to study the sun. Uh, we have to keep an eye on, on, on this mission. It will be important because it will involve more than two, uh, two, two elements. There is also activities in the group of Mike Ireland in, 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 at ANU uh, about developing a formation flying ground and, and CubeSat demonstrator. Uh, the idea is to have a, a full six axis movable telescope, uh, which can be used to demonstrate a uh, CubeSat compatible uh, metrology system for formation flying and interferometry uh, in space. Uh, the next, uh, now I'm, I'm going into the next. Um, requirement, technology requirement, uh, which is starlight suppression. Um, so roughly the high level requirements on the instrument, on the instability of the instrument will be to reach a null depth, so a contrast of 10 to the minus five uh, with a stability of 10 to the minus six over 50,000 seconds, which is um, more or less 15 hours uh, over the whole band bandwidth. So something like five to 20 micron. 
Uh, and this puts huge uh, constraint on the uh, control of the, of the array. So the, the amplitude has to be controlled with a precision of 0.05% RMS. And the phase, so the different uh, phase between the, the arms of the instrument uh, has to be controlled with a precision of one nanometer RMS. Um, so this is something that is uh, a challenging control problem, uh, but we can probably relax this, this constraint using post-processing technique. It's something we need to, to work on uh, in, in, in the live project. State of the art at 10 micron, I will, I will focus on, at, on, on 10 micron dulling interferometry. So there has been a different uh, test bench at JPL, uh, NASA JPL, uh, and mostly the, the planet detection test bed, which has demonstrated uh, null depths of uh, eight times 10 to the minus six, uh, with a precision stability of 10 to the minus eight. So this is good enough uh, for life. This is the requirements. Uh, this was done at room temperature and over 10% bandwidth. And so one, one of the goals, I will come back to that, of, of, of the workshop of, the, um, of one of the test bench that ETH is working on, which is called NICE, I will come back to that, is to reproduce this kind of experiment at cryo temperature. And you can see actually the, at the, the bottom plot here shows the results from this, uh, this test bench, from the JPL test bench. So you can see uh, the modulation map uh, of, of the, the, the bench, and you, the blue point are the measurements. That's the planet measurement, uh, the simulated planet measurement. And that's the, the measurement that were used to uh, produce the result of uh, stability of 10 to the minus eight after post-processing, which, uh, which is amazing um, with the right uh, modulation uh, template, as you can see by the red, uh, the red line. Uh, there also, we have been working on, 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 on milling interferometry at 10 micron in, on the ground with ground-based telescope. Um, and so on the LBTI and interferometric nuller in Arizona, we have been achieving the null depths of 10 to the minus 2 and a stability of 10 to the minus 4 um, after post-processing. This was limited mostly by the thermal background, this, uh, this uh, classical problem for 10 micron ground-based astronomy. This is a problem that we won't have uh, in space. Uh, now I'm going into the third um, requirement about sensitivity. Uh, we'll just say a few words about what is needed. Uh, and uh, one of the main key technology of, of life is the detector, an infrared detector working at from five to 20 micron. And actually the, the quality of the detector will have a direct impact on the spectral resolution that we can use to characterize the exoplanet. So this detector has to have a really low read noise and a high QE um, to maximize the number of planets that we can characterize and, the, and the, the spectral resolution that we can achieve. So the requirements are the study, but likely will have to be five times better than the James Webb MIRI uh, detector um, in terms of read noise. So right now the, the James Webb detector is something like 14 electron RMS and we would aim for something which is uh, a few electron RMS uh, if we really want to um, achieve the 100 uh, spectral resolution that we need. Um, thermal noise and detector cooling. So the key uh, aspect here is to achieve uh, optics uh, have to be cooled down to 40K. Uh, in order to keep the, the good uh, performance at 20 micron. Um, we have also to, have, uh, to design the baffle and the surface has to have to be really clean uh, in order to mitigate scattered light. So this is a, a huge uh, designing problem for the, for the telescopes. Uh, it also has to be uh, really thermally stable uh, in order to have stable null measurement. And uh, we know that's possible to achieve this kind of uh, cooling uh, passively. Uh, so to reach optics to down to 40K, this has been done by uh, on the Herschel and Planck satellite, for instance. Um, so the knowledge on, on, on how to do that is, is, is there, uh, especially on the ESA side. Um, next, I will jump into the current activities. Um, that we are planning to do over the next few years uh, regarding life. So ETH is working on, the, on NICE, which is the ETH cryogenic test bench. NICE is for Nulling Interferometric Cryogenic Experiment for Life. 
And the goal of, of NICE is to enhance the technology readiness uh, of broadband nulling um, and to uh, demonstrate the nulling combination scheme at cryo temperature and beyond the 10% bandwidth. So the, one of the goal would be to, to reproduce this experiment that, uh, that was done at JPL at, uh, at room temperature. You can see again the, the plot at the, at the bottom would be to reproduce this measurement uh, with the same precision, uh, but at cryo temperature. Uh, in order to increase the TRL level of, um, of life. Another new activity uh, that we are starting in, in a few months, uh, it's, we, want, we will develop the first nulling instrument for the VLTI. So the VLTI is the interferometric uh, facility in, uh, uh, in Chile. Um, and so we have two concepts, one is called I5 and one is called Viking. And so the goal is to build the first milling instrument for the VLTI and to, in order to do precision spectroscopy and astrometry at L band, so 3.8 micron. Scientific goal would be to constrain planet formation and access to the snow line. So the, the baseline of the VLTI can go up to 200 meters, which, which can provide really high angular resolution in order to go um, within the snow line and within the habitable zone of nearby stars. So we got, uh, we received in, at the University of Liège an ERC grant to build such an instrument uh, over the next five years. And also one of the goal of these uh, new uh, ideas and concepts would be to demonstrate the live beam combination scheme, data acquisition and reduction techniques uh, on Sky. Uh, also this year, uh, the LBTI team in Arizona published the result from the host survey, uh, which was dedicated to looking at the dust level in the habitable zone of nearby stars. So as you may know, this, this dust in the habitable zone is a noise for life. We don't want the, the star that we observe to have too much of this dust because it will mask uh, planets uh, in the habitable zone. So the LBTI was designed to look at this dust using nulling interferometry at 10 micron uh, using two telescopes. So the, the results were published this year and uh, the good news is that the the result are that the median dust density around nearby stars is 3 zodi, and we have good confidence that it's uh, below 27 zodi, so 95% confidence. So that's a really good news for life, but I also showed this plot to show you uh, what kind of precision that we can achieve with nulling and interferometry. So the bottom plot show the sensitivity of different instrument. Um, in terms of zodi, so one zodi is one time the density of the dust in the solar system. And you can see in yellow, WISE, WISE, this is this, this single dish photometric space instrument. The sensitivity is uh, around 1000 zodi, um, and it's mostly limited by the calibration of the stellar flux. So WISE cannot subtract the, the stellar flux um, besides by calibrating it uh, in post-processing. And this is what's limiting the, the precision. From the ground first with the first generation milling instrument, so the Keck Nuller in blue, uh, so milling instrument, so removing the starlight from the, from the data, uh, you can gain one order of magnitude in, on, on, on the measurement, so more or less 100 zodi uh, sensitivity. And then the new generation milling instrument, the LBTI, uh, go even further with another order of magnitude uh, in the detection. Um, so by, by removing really the, the starlight, we can uh, uh, improve uh, the, the quality and the, and, and, and the contrast that we can achieve in the habitable zone, even being on the ground compared to space um, in this case. There are other activities uh, on nulling, actually a lot of activities. So Caltech and, and, and JPL are working on the Vortex Fiber Nuller for the Keck. And the idea is to combine nulling with uh, uh, high resolution spectroscopy. This is a really promising, promising idea. There is also the GLIT instrument on Subaru doing nulling on a single um, a mirror uh, with, with sub uh, aperture and to demonstrate uh, integrated optics nulling um, at, at, at three micron. Uh, the University of Paris, uh, the team of Sylvester Lacour is also working on the PIXAP project, which is a 3U CubeSat in order to demonstrate uh, light injection into single mode single fibers in space uh, and to achieve really precise uh, photometry uh, in space. Um, 
this is my summary slide. So this is the key points of my talk. Um, I, will, I will go over them. So we are now in the new era of exoplanet characterization with long baseline interferometry. We have seen the new result from the gravity team uh, it was the first characterization of an exoplanet using uh, interferometry. We have been doing a lot of progress in key technologies over the past few uh, years and decades uh, in, in key technologies like, like formation flying, so starlight suppression, ground-based nulling uh, in the US um, with the Keck Nuller and the LBTI. We are starting new projects in Europe uh, to, uh, to, to push a technology of nulling interferometry. So there is the, the nice test bench to demonstrate cryogenic nulling uh, enable the life uh, technology. There is this, the DRC nulling instrument for the VLTI, which is starting over the next five years. Also working on formation, formation flying using CubeSat uh, in, in, in Australia. Uh, but we need more technology support program, uh, especially to, co to improve the broadband coverage of such an instrument uh, to, to increase the 10% the bandwidth uh, and nulling over the whole live uh, bandwidth and for that we need to work on spatial and modal filters the beam technology the beam combination technologies and to get better uh, detectors so if you are interested in in, in contributing to uh, one of these uh, uh, topics please uh, contact us uh, I, I put the email of sasha for the for the science adrian glauser for the nice uh, eth test bench and myself for the technology or the nulling uh, VLTI instrument. And I will end this talk by uh, two announcements. So we have in December uh, this year, we have two uh, workshops. We have first uh, a two days live workshop, will be the third uh, workshop after the one in, in Berlin and the one in Zurich. Um, and so you can find the, the information about the workshop on, on this page. And it will happen the same week. So the, the next two days, we will have the Sci-Fi Workshop 1, which will kick off this ERC project to build um, a nulling instrument uh, on the VLTI. And so if you're interested, please, please contact me. Uh, and I will take questions. Thank you.